Good morning and welcome to the fifth primary colors of education conference by network of education policy centers. My name is Ulvia and today I have the honor to open this conference. Today we have participants from 20 countries, education specialists, teachers, researchers, teacher trainers, and this variety represents perfectly what the primary colors of education conference is meant to be a place where we collect narratives about education from the network and wider after almost two years from the beginning of pandemic the discussion about the future of education is more than actual and the biggest learning from the last year is that we need to work together and the cooperation and dialogue are the only way possible to shape the future. NEPS does see our work and also this conference as a contribution to cooperation and dialogue. The two days conference has twofold aim to reflect on approaches applied during the crisis and to propose possible directions for the education in the future. The future will be the topic for the second day of the conference on December 7th. Our today program is dedicated to inclusion, the interpretation, implementation, and monitoring of inclusive education, which is ongoing in many countries of NEPS region and wider. The pandemic shows that inclusive systems are more resilient in time of crisis and can provide adequate support to all learners. The panel discussions will present how inclusion and participation are represented in several members' national initiatives and international projects. I'm very pleased to introduce the opening speaker of this year conference, Lana Zhurkun, NEPS Executive Director. Good morning, Lala. Lana will wrap up her uh, experience in the field of inclusion education, inclusion and education, and to which extent inclusion is integrated as fundamental principle in education system in our region. Enjoy the conference. Lana, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Olga, for the introduction. I'm, of course, very happy that uh, we are having another conference. Um, very unhappy that it's still online, uh, but this is uh, live these days, and, and I hope that although we are online, we will still manage to have a dialogue and to discuss the issues that, that we are all concerned about. Um, it's a bit strange to have a keynote speaker on the conference who is from the organization that is organizing, uh, but somehow when we were preparing this, we thought that uh, <clears throat> the two years that we have spent really working on inclusion so, so um, deeply um, that somehow I might be the person who can really wrap up everything that we've learned in the two years um, and start the discussion on this very important topic. So um, I will start. <laughs> Sorry. So inclusion and inclusive uh, education has been at the heart of our work from the very beginning of our network, now almost 15 years ago, um, although some of us have been working on it even longer. Um, but however, in the last two years, we really had the opportunity, but also the urgency to dive even deeper into it. Um, two reasons for this. On one hand, it was the UNESCO Regional Report 2021 on inclusion and education uh, that examined the situation in the 30 countries of exactly the NEPTS region, what we call the NEPTS region in our, in our family, but what actually consists of East and Southeast Europe, Caucasus, Central Asia, Turkey, and Mongolia. Um, but it was also prompted by the emergency of the global pandemic on education and the fact that the pandemic and closure of schools has further deepened educational inequalities. And after 20 years of work in this field and almost 30 years of our systems in the region, um, 
being in the reform process, one feels that we keep futilely repeating the same thing and nothing moves. So when I was preparing for this lecture, um, it almost felt like, is it worth it? Um, I have nothing more to say than what I've said before. Um, or everything was already said. <laughs> However, the need to continue to advocate for inclusion and inclusion policies and practices has not ended. So we go on in hope that things will move further. Uh, we go on because we have not made it. The region covered by NETS, and I would say even globally, we're still struggling on many levels to reach the standards and visions of authentic inclusion. We find ourselves still discussing and explaining the holistic understanding of inclusion. The all means all concept still eludes many. We often get caught up in debates on what is inclusion, whether inclusion is needed, and who is it for? Um, and are commonly facing attitudinal barriers to inclusion from different stakeholder groups. This um, attitudinal um, barrier is something that we at NEPTS are really working hard to break. The understanding that inclusion is for all and that it benefits all uh, is something that really needs to be driven um, to the minds of everybody in the society. And then, of course, in particular, to those working in education. Uh, the misconceptions and confusions of similar yet distinct concepts of equality, equity, and inclusion do not help uh, our work. And the asynchronicity of inclusive reforms in the region also puts countries at different paces, phases of implementation. However, as futile as it sometimes feels, progress towards a rights-based approach to inclusive education in the region has been made in the last 20 years. Um, and the regional report that I've mentioned already does show this. Education levels, which were already high in our region, uh, actually among the world's highest, have even increased rapidly in those 20 years. Out of school rates fell by half. Countries have been moving away from the medical models. The percentage of children with disabilities in special schools fell from 78% in 2005 to 53% in 2015. The percentage of children in residential institutions fell by 30% in the same period. So there has been progress and schools are also making their support system broader and more flexible. In every country we can find teachers and school leaders who are implementing authentic inclusion and classrooms and even schools in which all really means all. Yet also, we also know that still many learners are not being supported and are suffering in non-inclusive context, while in some areas regression can also be noted. We can notice the policy gaps and often assuming that policies are okay, but we fail in implementation. This is many times true or often true. However, however the policy gaps go both ways. And we have, as mentioned, classrooms and schools that are better than the policies of the countries. Politics and policies do fail the inclusion goal. From access to education, integrity of the system, content both in the curriculum and textbooks of education, teacher preparedness, assessment, participation, all of this in policy level are still not where they need to be. Uh, so we need to continue working at the policy level uh, regardless of, although sometimes we see that policies might be better than what we see uh, at implementation level. And although many things can be done at school level and many of our members and a lot of our projects are working exactly of that, on that level, um, uh, the failure of politics and policies need to be addressed as there is really no excuse in 2021 to have the situation that we have. So I will concentrate uh, my presentation on the issues on the policy issues and try to illustrate with some data an example from our countries uh, what is not being done well. So we still have many countries in the region that have to they have that have not yet shed the legacy of segregated education. And the segregated education we don't see only in the special schools or schools that are um, intended for children with, uh, with 
special educational needs, but also to linguistic minorities, ethnic minorities, and different ways in which we segregate our students. Uh, overall, one in three students with special needs in Central and Eastern Europe are still placed in special schools. In Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and Mongolia, the share of youth with disabilities in out-of-school population is twice as large as the share of them in the school population. In 50 of the 30 educational systems in our region, school admission still depends on medical and psychological assessments and other selection procedures. What passes for inclusive may instead be a medical defined focus on disability. So we are not really clear in our definitions and in our policies uh, how we understand inclusion. Other forms of segregation and discrimination persist and they hinder inclusion. For example, about 60% of Roma, Ashkali, and Egyptian youth in the Balkans do not attend upper secondary school, and only 3% completed in Montenegro. Members of these groups are also dispropor disproportionately diagnosed with intellectual disabilities. And in Slovakia, Roma constitute 42% of those in special schools in 2018. We also have a big discrepancy with uh, socioeconomic status of our students and, and, and their completion of, of education. So, for example, in Mongolia, 94% of richest, but only 37% of the poorest complete secondary school. Uh, the issue of migration, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers is also quite, quite bleak in many countries. And Turkey, which has made a great effort and has actually uh, absorbed more than 600,000 uh, Syrian students in public schools, still 37% of Syrian refugees are not in school in Turkey. And looking at how we understand the inclusion at policy level, we can see that in 21 out of the 30 education systems, there are separate schools or classes for linguistic minorities. And this parallel provision often works against inclusion, as I've mentioned already. Gender inequality in education has become, or still remains, a highly contested topic. In several countries, a traditional gender lens reinforces gender stereotypes. This is true for our region, but not only for our region. Uh, and it's a, another issue that we need to continue working on. Another big issue is, of course, sexual orientation and gender identity, which is almost never mentioned in our schools or very little mentioned in our schools. And we have only seven countries in the region who have policies or actions that explicitly address uh, those issues. Inclusive education should encompass all learners. However, in laws and other documents, a 19 out of the 30 education system reviewed in the region defines special education needs in relation to disability, while 12 also include a variety of other learner groups. These tend to be mainly gifted learners. So we have now kind of two groups, the special needs, the gifted, we see them as, as something that needs to be worked on. And then we have a definition of those who are vulnerable. Um, and in a, out of these 30 countries, 20 focus on multiple marginalized or vulnerable groups. So these are beyond learners with special education needs or disabilities. But even with this expanded scope, uh, it should be seen as just one step towards eventually moving away from any form of categorizing, categorization or group-based definition of learner identification. So even in the systems that have a broader understanding, is still not really an inclusive understanding. Inclusive education, as we all know, aims to dismantle barriers by relying on the principle that every learner matters and every learner matters equally. We know, and studies have shown, that inclusion can deliver improvement in academic achievement, in social and emotional development, self-esteem and peer acceptance. Ensuring student diversity in mainstream classrooms and schools can prevent stigma, stereotyping, discrimination, alienation, and other um, consequences of such behavior, behavior, including radicalization. It can contribute to social justice, recognition of differences, and representation of all groups in education policies and programs, counteracting tendencies that allow exceptions and exclusions. Authentic inclusion takes place when the boundaries between mainstream and minority students 
cease to exist, where all students learn from one another and can achieve their full learning potential. While the equity approach, which we often uh, see um, as equal to inclusion, but it's not. So while the equity approach, for example, preparing additional or different curriculum for those in need may actually invite stigmatization. So we see the students in remedial classes as weak learners. Um, an inclusive curriculum aims to install in all learners a positive sense of self-esteem and self-worth, as well as a sense of belonging in the school and therefore in the society. And this belonging in the school um, is one of the key um, elements of well-being of students. It's a motivation, it's, 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 it's actually good for everybody. Um, and it's something that we really need to look at inclusion from this point of view uh, of the student experience. So when we monitor uh, inclusion, it's not only about the end result, but it's also about the process. And we really need to start looking um, at monitoring inclusion from the perspective of students uh, feelings, let's say, and how they feel in school. Um, so we have inclusion has the potential to more explicitly support not only the learning, but also the well-being of all learners. Um, and, and in that way, support the societal aim for diversity. So uh, in this, in this uh, uh, idea that we need to fulfill every learner's potential, the prerequisite for adequate policy response is to see learner's diversity not as a challenge, not as a problem, but as an opportunity. It is, of course, the reality um, that diversity exists in every classroom, in every school. It might not be diversity as we understand it, uh, but or as, as let's say in this common understanding of ethnicity or uh, language or socioeconomic status, uh, but diversity exists in every in every classroom, and it's important that we see these as opportunities. Uh, and I will now concentrate a little bit more on, on where the, the system fails or where the policies fail in the, in the curriculum and textbooks. Um, and although countries have provisions for equity in their curriculum, again, we are talking about equity rather than inclusion. Um, and progress has been made in development, representation, as well as assessment adjustments to learners' abilities. The curricula still reflect political divisions that result in marginalized and stereotypical representation of the groups that lack political or social recognition in the respective societies. And it could be different groups in different countries, but it's important to understand that this power uh, idea uh, is definitely one thing that, that is blocking inclusion and that is something that we need to fight uh, for. When we look at textbooks in, in many countries, um, they confirm that much is to be done specifically in regard to gender equality, ethnic identity, and LGBTI. Um, in some cases, as I said, there is even regression. So, for example, the Turkish curricula in 2016 removed content referring to gender equality from it. But, but even looking at just uh, commonly the gender stereotyping in textbooks throughout the region um, is quite dramatic and needs to be addressed. Introducing inclusion principle in textbook review criteria on use of language and images uh, should be a path forward. And although we do have examples of such uh, uh, reviews of textbooks, what we find is that uh, the weight that inclusion has in selection of te textbooks is actually too low for it to make a proper change. And still many textbooks in our region actually promote stereotyping either ethnic groups uh, or if nothing else glorifying uh, the majority which is also a way of stereotyping minority <clears throat> LGBTI and Roma are the most invisible in the curriculum and textbooks across the region um, as I said only seven countries have some kind of explicit prohibiting based on sexual orientation or gender identity and expression uh, and in the in the let's say most uh, 
in Southeast Europe and Eastern Europe, where there is most uh, Roma population, so 14 countries were examined, only nine, uh, nine out of these 14 do not mention Roma at all in their curriculum. So it's like they do not exist in our societies. Various models of adapted assessment are present in the region, and they do help learners demonstrate their progress. However, national assessment systems have a long way to go to become fully inclusive and respond to real individual need. The competitive systems that we have actually do not serve inclusion, and inclusion and competition in the same classroom actually do not work. Uh, so this is something that we really need to also think about uh, when we uh, do any kind of external assessment of our schools or uh, our students, where we constantly do ranking, uh, which is definitely not something that, that serves inclusion. Um, and when we look at larger studies, uh, global studies like PISA and so on, uh, which do this at national level, um, and we know what happens with policies, and of course not in all countries, but often what is important for the policies or the politics is how better or how much better we are than our neighbors. And we are not looking at those results in the sense of trying to improve our systems. Uh, but uh, if we are better than the neighbor, especially if this is a neighbor that we do not have great <laughs> relationships with, then it's fine. Uh, and we can go on without really using the data that PISA and other external assessments do provide us to improve our systems. Uh, another thing that is very important and that often happens in our region is that we try to do reforms uh, one by one and not understanding that actually, uh, for example, curriculum textbooks assessment, they have to be done in parallel because they have a domino effect on one another. And if parallel, uh, changes are not done, actually, the, the, the results of these reforms are not effective. There is, a, let's say, a, a commitment which, might, which can be seen as positive, and it was seen as positive, uh, to provide education in students' home language. Uh, and more than 70% of the countries in the region provide schools or classes using the home languages or uh, mother tongues of, of the students. Um, However, there are dangers in such parallel provision. Some groups are taught apart according to different curriculum, and often the content on the minority history and culture is taught only to the minority themselves, uh, leaving them as a part and not really part of, of the society. Inclusion, of course, is best served through bilingual schools where the ethnic groups learn together in both languages and the common curriculum includes and is representative of both groups or three groups or however many groups we might have, um, but we have very few uh, examples of that. One that we can point out is the Slovene Hungarian schools in Slovenia, but as I said, it's a very rare exception. Uh, curricula are also commonly adapted to learner needs through individualized education plans, which exist in almost all countries, usually mainly used for children with special education needs. However, procedures for developing and implementing them remain a challenge. Teachers do not feel totally prepared to use them. Uh, there is little cooperation between the learner, uh, the teacher, the parent, uh, or a specialist in providing those individual plans and really uh, making the best out of them as they were imagined as a policy. Uh, we do need innovative, flexible solutions the, for, for some learners, learners from remote areas, learners who might uh, be from nomadic groups. We have some very good examples from Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Russian Federation, Uzbekistan, where they use the adapting the school calendar, setting up mobile classrooms and ensuring the curriculum is relevant to their learners. Again, there, can, there, there, are, there are lessons to be learned from that. I would say maybe the biggest problem that we face, although I'm, I'm a big curriculum fan, so I think uh, what, what we say we will learn <laughs> is very important, uh, but um, one that we all know is the preparedness of teachers. We need teachers to be prepared, empowered, and motivated to teach all students. Um, to achieve this, we need different teacher education. The teacher education that we have now, especially pre-service, uh, should be based on, it's not based on inclusion paradigm, and it should be. Currently, initial teacher education mostly offers a few subjects on the topic, 
and then tries to uh, fill in the gaps through in-service training or continuous professional development, usually not systematically done, uh, often only for the motivated teachers and those who really want to do it anyway. Um, and we have large proportions of teacher uh, force which is not really ready to teach in inclusive classrooms. Um, and when you look at the data among 14 countries in the region, only 50% of teachers from lower secondary school felt prepared to work in mixed ability classroom and even less in culturally diverse classrooms. And this, I think, uh, is really an alarming data uh, for our region because we don't have a single country which is not um, multicultural in some way. So we really need to uh, work on that quite quite strongly. Another thing is school leaders or head teachers are, we know that they're essential in installing an inclusive school ethos, uh, but programs that would support this in the region are, are not, uh, there are not many. Actually, we see school leaders uh, left uh, uh, almost alone uh, in this task of trying to lead the school. Um, there are just a few countries that have obligatory training for school leaders or licensing of school leaders. Often what happens, the best teacher becomes the school leader. In a way, this is a loss on both ways because we lose a teacher. Often our teachers, school leaders are not teaching at all. We do have some exceptions in the region, but school leaders go mostly into management. And they are seen as managers of the school, but not as pedagogical leaders. Uh, and this is something that, that needs to be uh, changed as well. Um, the aging of the teaching force that, that we are facing makes the need to change uh, even more pressing. Um, we need to really kind of concentrate the in-service provision uh, on teachers with more than five years of experience, um, and we really need to work quite strongly on that. Uh, the idea of changing pre-service uh, education for teachers has been around for many years. We do have another, I would say, attitudinal uh, problem there uh, because the universities or the, co the colleges that do teacher education um, are very resistant to this change. Um, we have this constant uh, say that they're autonomous institutions and that policy cannot influence um, uh, universities as free institutions. Um, and this creates a lot of problems. Uh, we have not seen yet how this can be solved. <laughs> um, and I don't think we have really a very good example uh, in the region of this, but this is something that needs to be discussed. Um, and we need to open this discussion of pre-service education for teachers in a much stronger way than we are currently doing. Uh, so we know that um, Teacher diversity shows commitment of the system to inclusion principles, but there is very little teacher diversity in our region. Mostly, again, we have uh, a very set type of teacher in school, of course, very much gender uh, oriented as well, so mostly women. And then we, of course, have uh, the support personnel in the system that is lacking. We do have support systems personnel, but not enough, and often buried in bureaucratic duties rather than uh, than working on uh, on issues that they should be working on. So, with COVID-19 crisis, uh, we have learned that teachers are essential workers. We also know that they are major agents of change in education. So, we really need to support teachers to be the champions of inclusions. But we need to acknowledge that among teacher force, there are institutional barriers and they are not really all for inclusion. How we break this uh, barrier, I'm not sure, except for advocacy and working closely with teachers. The pandemic and school closures have made it even more difficult to reach the goals of inclusion. We've all seen that, um, while at the same time making it even more urgent. Um, and the governments have responded with urgency to the pandemic in education. However, almost after almost two years in the situation, we do see that the most disadvantaged learners are further behind um, and the policies are not actually following as quickly as they should. Um, there are learnings from the pandemic on distance education solutions on cooperation with parents in home environments that we should take forward. We need a larger focus on psychosocial support of learners and teachers. 
Um, and finally, we really need to listen and provide spaces for learners' voices throughout the system. Participation of learners is really at the low level in the region, and the student voice is something that we need to work hard. The reality is that the need for strong and inclusive education policy is greater than ever, and we at NEPTS are, of course, committed to this goal. I hope our conference will provide us with new ideas and motivation to continue on this path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lana. Thank you. Um... The participants, maybe any questions, any comments, any reflections? You know, Lana, uh, I, of course, I agree with uh, many points you made, but I especially would like to stress the importance of raising voices, because in this, uh, in this uh, system where the top has some uh, has some images and mental patterns of what to do and hides the inclusion and the equity and hiding e equality and inclusion and packing this in equity of opportunities. And uh, sometimes schools and teachers hiding their uh, unwillingness to do inclusion uh, behind the parents that parents don't want or so many. I think the raising voice, maybe it is the, the most important strategy really to say who thinks what and who wants what in terms of inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. If no questions and reflections, I would like to invite you uh, and inform that now we're moving to the first panel. And welcome to the first panel. Lana, I think you will be moderating it. Thank you very much. Yes, now I turn to a different hat and I start moderating our, our, our session. Uh, and I'm very happy that we will uh, hear uh, from several of our members in, in, this, uh, in this session. So the first panel of the conference will present the three, what we call the emergency funds um, in, 2020, in 2020 and 2021, uh, NEPS has started this idea of uh, emergency fund where we saw a great need uh, among membership um, and in the systems for, for some urgent uh, actions uh, during the pandemic situation. Um, and we have supported around 10 of those initiatives in the second round, so round two, uh, six members initiatives were supported. Um, this was uh, um, uh, supported also with the grant from Open Society Foundation, um, and we will present three of those initiatives today. So I would like to present uh, our, our panelists. Um, so we have uh, Jasminka Markovic from Center for Education Policy Centers, our member in Serbia. Um, they conducted research on school response to public health crisis in Serbia, Kazakhstan, and Romania. It was a comparative study. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, Jane Esther from Praxis, our Estonian member that implemented the project Contact Grabber, Keep on Studying, and we'll hear uh, something about that. And also Batergal Baktuak from Mongolian Education Alliance from Mongolia, our Mongolian member that implemented the initiative Student Journalism Program. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, Okay, so uh, we will start straight away with the with the little presentation of each. We'll I'll invite Yasminka first to present um, uh, their initiative uh, shortly, and then we'll go um, through the other panelists. Thank you very much, Yasminka. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Belgrade. Uh, hi, Alana. Thank you for gathering uh, us. It's so great to see so many familiar faces that you haven't seen for a while, especially in those, you know, crazy circumstances. Uh, speaking about emergency uh, fund, I will focus on what we have done in Serbia and make connection later on a bit with the uh, with, uh, comparative report you referred to. So, uh, bearing in mind that we are primarily a research organization, it's not surprised that 
our uh, project actually consists of the research that covers uh, primary and secondary schools across uh, Serbia with the aim of providing reliable data on the school staff experience in responding to COVID-19 situation and how it influence changes in organization of the schoolwork, organization and implementation of the distance, actually online teaching and learning, assessment to students and things like that. Uh, why it was, why it has been so important. Uh, it, it is important uh, since there is no uh, such a study or research has been done so far and we really need it as a country uh, kind of the evidence on school experience and in, on newly established practices uh, speaking about sample or participating uh, schools uh, probably you all know that we have a pretty huge number of the different schools and pretty developed school network uh, that assumes primary schools, the secondary schools that are divided into the few groups. So uh, we have vocational schools, we have general education schools, as well as art schools. So uh, for us, it was important to have all the type of schools involved in the research, since uh, so many of them uh, have some specificities. For example, for the vocational schools, it was important how work-based learning is organized, uh, knowing that a uh, huge number of students is implementing their professional practice in the companies. For the art schools that assume uh, practice, assumed, you know, gathering of so many people and things like that. So at the end, we uh, send online questionnaire and uh, 50 directors of primary schools uh, and 100 teachers of primary schools, 30 directors and 60 teachers from vet schools, 15 directors of general schools and 15 teachers of general schools, as well as five directors and 10 teachers from, from uh, art schools participated. Uh, the specific questions or areas that we have asked them uh, were divided into the few, let's say, sections. So school directors are asked about their practices and experiences related to organization of school work and management of human resources, which was particularly important because usually we forget that actually teachers and their families are also exposed to the virus. So it means that it happens that uh, in some schools uh, happened actually that a lot of teachers were sick. So it was rather challenging even you have in theory perfect management system, it was pretty much challenging to organize school work. So uh, we were interested uh, to uh, research how directors were informed on the steps they had taken at the beginning of the state of emergency and later on during the distance learning, how well they were informed on the final examination and how they organized, which was uh, of spe uh, specific importance for the primary schools bearing in mind that uh, final examination um, is used in our country for enrollment to secondary schools, but also it was uh, interesting to see how they organize final examination in vocational schools, since such uh, examination uh, needs to involve the different stakeholders, including employers, economy, representatives, uh, etc. Uh, we surveyed uh, what they uh, were main challenges for them, how they overcome obstacles, what were the main sources of their information, how helpful, helpful were different stakeholders in informing them. I suppose in many other countries it was pretty the same. The new information on how to organize, what to do, how to protect students, how to involve students from vulnerable uh, groups how to secure techniques and technologies uh, changed from day to day, uh, at least in Serbia. So for us, it was very much important to see actually how information flow went and who was helpful and uh, where were the challenges in communication. Speaking about teachers, uh, we focused our questions rather on uh, their teaching and uh, learning activities they uh, implemented during the online teaching. 
we were interested to see what methods and tools they used, how did they create the teaching materials, how did they grade students, how did they collect students' feedbacks, and uh, how they involved different groups of students, as well as how they communicated with students and uh, how they communicated uh, with parents because uh, communication with parents is something that suffered a lot during during uh, you know this this uh, situation and at the end upon the completion of the research we organized three online events with the aim of presenting the research results to different audience and uh, it was uh, good because um, some policy makers, representatives of national institutions, including Ministry of Education, participated in and at the end we hope so uh, actually that uh, evidences we collected will uh, have uh, you know a kind of the reflection in some future policies regarding to uh, education that it's we are still implementing in this uh, state of emergency. Thank you, Yasminka, for this introduction. Uh, Jane, can we hear from you and what Praxis has done? Yes, of course. My greetings from Tallinn, Estonia, and I'm very pleased to be invited here in this conference. Happy to hear uh, our ideas about our project as well, which is called Alarm Barriers. So uh, I start off with a problem, why we started this, uh, this project and it was um, initiated by the reason that, uh, or the evidence that uh, every sixth student in Estonia doesn't complete their studies uh, within the nominal period in the secondary school. So this is quite a big amount of students and, and, we, we, uh, and there, there are, of course there are several reasons behind that. For for example, um, the problems or potential problems of students uh, are not noticed or they are noticed uh, too late when the pro problem has already worsened. Um, sometimes there are uh, uh, not clearly defined roles and responsibilities who should react to, to students' problems. For example, if there's a problem uh, in a specific subject in mathematics, for example, uh, who should do something? Is it the mathematics teacher? Is it uh, is it a class teacher, teacher, is it a support specialist? So there are like a bunch of people who should do something, but uh, when and who exactly, this is kind of undecided sometimes. Uh, there's also a situation or, or, a, or a problem that there is not enough knowledge on how to react to a problem. Um, our teachers uh, would not have um, separate uh, skills, uh, social skills, like how to deal with delicate situations, how, for example, to approach a student uh, in case of uh, in case of a problem or, or talk with parents. And um, these are all very delicate situations. And then some teachers are not like prepared for these kinds of situations. Um, and also, uh, which is like, it's very human, uh, aspect also like not knowing when it is the right time to react or intervene and we, we kind of tend to uh, think that maybe this problem kind of passes maybe it's not that serious enough and so on and so on so all these uh, factors contribute to the to this situation that the problems uh, might not be noticed and uh, this is how we decided to, to uh, develop this our uh, intervention that we call alarm bell uh, which should be, uh, from one hand, uh, as an alert system or a warning system, early warning system, and from the other hand, a response system that would help to react to the students' problems. So what it is, it's um, based on online information system uh, that schools use in Estonia. There are two information platforms. One is called Studium and the other one is called E-Call or E-School in English. And the second one is, is the one that we used for that. There are slightly more than 50% of the gymnasiums that use this platform. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a good coverage uh, among gymnasiums. And all the student outcomes, study outcomes are, are inserted to this information system. Uh, so the idea of this uh, new module in this system is to automatically uh, identify the risks uh, in case of each student 
uh, and and send out a warning if if a certain pattern uh, in a in a study outcomes or study behavior has emerged. And uh, these uh, risk factors uh, we have defined them ourselves. Uh, it's about average grades. It's about absences. It takes into account negative remarks, uh, also being late to lessons uh, is one factor. So it's nothing new, but, uh, but basically in, in order to, to work, we had to define them more specifically and, uh, and, uh, and insert them and develop them in this information tool. Um, one of the central aspects of our uh, intervention is, uh, is a message uh, that the teacher receives. And in some, some cases, it's also a support, uh, support specialist. So it, this message um, uh, displays um, someone's mic is on. Kind of. Tanya, maybe you can mute your. Thank you. Otherwise, it's, it, it got a little bit noisy. Um, so yeah, I was talking about like this central message or that that the re teacher receives when when this uh, risk factors uh, are identified in case of a student. Uh, it uses a social norm or social comparison uh, that indicates how the results uh, or the behavior of of the student uh, deviates from other students. So for example, it might say that. In the last two weeks, uh, Jana is one of the few in the class who has had unauthorized absences on three different days. And it also sa says that talking to a student will help you find out if Jana needs support to progress in their studies. So it kind of yes, uses this behavioral insight and then the social comparison aspect and and um, and, uh, and uh, not just teachers to react. Uh, and not just them to, to speak to a student and verify whether he or she needs some help or some assistance uh, in order to progress. Uh, so, uh, like, there might be uh, warnings on three different levels, um, depending on how severe is the problem or, or the reasons behind the warning. Uh, on third level, uh, the message goes automatically also to a support specialist. So this is the, the, our idea how to engage uh, more than one person in the school when, when there is a potential problem and, and it, that it wouldn't be only um, uh, the respons responsibility of one, one person. And uh, now, um, yeah, so this is, this is the idea of the project and what we are doing now is that we, are, we try to carry out the study uh, starting from January. Um, a randomized control trial uh, in order to, to investigate uh, whether this intervention really has an impact and what kind of impact. Because in some cases, uh, I mean, with the science, you can you can also worsen the situation. Uh, there can adverse effects as well, especially if you use these social norms and social comparison. And so therefore, I think it is very important to measure the real real effect of this intervention. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Jana or Jane, I'm not sure about the... Are you Jana or... Well, it is Jana, yes, but uh, Jana. I... I really... okay. Thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting something that we haven't seen actually before because it tries to use uh, uh, the online resources that we have and the nudging uh, method in order to actually alarm uh, the system, the school, the teacher, the student, that there, there might be a problem. And we'll see when the measurement comes out how effective that is. Thank you. Uh, Batya, uh, something completely different now, direct work with students. So Batya, tell us about your project. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Mongolia. Good evening. Actually, it's evening already. Uh, and happy to see you all. Um, so uh, what we have done is um, during the pandemic uh, school closure in the past two school years, uh, Mongolia is one of the few countries that had the longest uh, days of school closure. And it is estimated that in the past two school years, 
about 50% of the uh, school days were off, <clears throat> not in classroom. Uh, and uh, the last year's um, uh, estimation by Ministry of Education said that uh, about 180,000 students, which is about a quarter of uh, students in uh, secondary school, which is from grade one through 12, uh, were not able to access any kind of distance learning, either be it on TV, uh, internet, or any other types of uh, learning. So uh, our idea was um, to um, end. Uh, the other part was that uh, uh, because of the pandemic and because of the, you know, especially this year, uh, when uh, the um, uh, issue of learning loss that was caused by the pandemic, uh, because of that, all any other activities than teaching is not taking place in schools, which means extracurricular activities are off. So uh, what we uh, had uh, uh, thought of was um, to uh, uh, promote uh, students uh, to raise their voices and talk about issues that concerns them and uh, try to uh, 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 promote um, active citizenship among uh, students. So uh, MEA, uh, one of uh, the three programmatic areas uh, is uh, youth development and uh, within our program, we uh, try to support um, extracurricular activities that uh, fosters uh, children's right to expression and right to participation. And uh, we started a uh, long time ago with the debate programs, debate clubs at schools, and then we uh, have um, also supported the creation of film clubs that uh, try to um, raise issues through watching documentaries and other video materials. And then the third program uh, is uh, a student journalism club, actually was initially supported by the education support program uh, in early, uh, almost 10 years ago. So, um, what we have done, uh, what we tried to do was first try to give uh, students uh, some uh, knowledge uh, about uh, media and information literacy. Second, uh, help uh, uh, students set up independent uh, student journalism clubs at schools. And then uh, through uh, the newspapers and other media uh, channels, students uh, raise their voices uh, about the issues that concerns them. And uh, so um, the uh, selection of the uh, location was an issue because initially we were, we planned to, to do everything in person because in September last year, the schools started reopening. And then uh, when we were preparing to start, launch the program, uh, we had uh, the next lockdown and we had to readjust and make everything into online and uh, uh, do everything through uh, Zoom and other platforms. And uh, we uh, approached um, um, the third largest city in the country, uh, uh, because we wanted to reach, uh, the initial idea was to reach as many schools as possible. And because the city has uh, more than 20 schools uh, and 16 of the schools were public schools. So that was it. And then uh, we um, announced the program and uh, had requirements for school selection that uh, the school should provide support to the clubs, uh, not only during the program uh, uh, initial, the, during the project time, but after um, the um, project ends uh, and uh, to 
have it included in the what is called the extracurricular plan of the school year uh, and uh, other um, uh, requirements. Uh, and to our surprise, all 16 public schools applied and they uh, agreed that they would uh, help set up the clubs as well as support it in the long run. So uh, what we started with the initial training uh, where uh, the uh, training was done through Zoom and we used uh, different uh, learning platforms, uh, uh, applications like Padlet, uh, Mentimeter, uh, Jamboard, so to make the um, online training interactive. Uh, and uh, then uh, the uh, schools set up their uh, uh, clubs. In the training, we involved one teacher who would be a guide for the film club and two students from each school. And then after the initial training, the students uh, went back to their school and organized the training uh, for the other students who uh, enrolled in the club and they started their uh, uh, activities. Uh, so the training was concentrating on, uh, of course, first on media and information literacy, second about different media types, uh, more focusing on newspaper, print and online forms, and uh, how to write what different types of writings and uh, the fourth part was about sustainability, how to promote their newspaper and how to continue running their uh, clubs. So usually the clubs are divided into different uh, teams, um, like there are journalists, there are uh, editors, there are a uh, marketing team. Uh, so um, it, uh, it is also uh providing students some uh practice on uh, entrepreneurship so um the uh, uh, clubs are running uh now uh, even uh even the schools reopened uh, extracurricular activities are also uh not uh they're not uh, allowed. Uh, so still uh, students are uh, meeting online after the school hours and uh, running the clubs. So basically this is it and maybe I can talk more about uh, the issues students raised later. Thank you very much Patya. So this one is about student voice. Very happy to, to hear about that. Uh, as one of the things that we definitely understand that um, are crucial for our systems. Okay, so these were the introductions to three very different, as you can see, quite quite different uh, projects, programs. Uh, one working on really the research, one uh, piloting uh, uh, something that, that could be an alarm bell and, and like a, a warning, and then one working directly with students on on. on on, on their voice. Um, Jasminka, a question for you now. So what do you find the systems uh, have done or, or, or can do in the future crisis from your study? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to divide my answer, you know, uh, what they have done and uh, definitely what uh, were the biggest challenges uh, actually identified as areas they can uh, do more. So, uh, for us, I have to be frank, uh, pretty surprisingly, uh, it seems like that all the countries established, and now I'm speaking about joint results, you know, not just for, for, for the Serbia, but as well as for Kazakhstan and Romania, because our partners uh, done pretty similar research uh, in those two countries. So it seems like that all the countries actually established uh, more or less efficient information flow. Um, at different levels. So uh, they had a great and, and done actually great uh, information exchange and cooperation with national authorities. 
and with the local educational authorities in the countries where such a level of educational authorities exist. At the same time, it seems like that communication between school management and the teachers were pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, less good with the parents and, and the students, but a lot of things uh, has been done in that area. So for the first time, uh, you know, uh, teachers and the principals organized uh, some teams meeting uh, with the parents, survivor groups and things like that. So it seems like that uh, most of the participants in, in, in education uh, haven't had serious problems with uh, information flow and, and uh, cooperation in that area. Uh, at the same time, uh, all the countries and all the school uh, schools participated uh, established uh, very good virtual environments, not just for the communication, but as well as for the teaching and uh, students' learning. It is different from country uh, to country. Uh, for example, uh, in countries they used uh, Microsoft Teams, in some countries, uh, Padlet platform. Uh, also, Zoom was uh, widely uh, used, Google Classrooms, Google Meet uh, opportunities uh, and similar. And it seemed like, and it was also, uh, I don't know, at least for me, a uh, pretty huge uh, surprise, but teachers uh, reported that they have pretty much developed uh, ICT competencies. And, and uh, teachers reported that they attended at least one in-service training dedicated to teacher digital competencies development the last two years. So not just, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic time, but, uh, you know, before it, which is pretty good sign. But uh, also they reported on a very well-developed, how to say, peer learning practice during the pandemic pandemic uh, time. Interesting, uh, and it was interesting because it was huge challenge before the pandemic. Uh, teachers in all the countries reported that they are using formative assessment much more than usually. Uh, yes, exactly. It was very interesting because formative assessment, assessment appeared to be challenge in general for the years in all the, all the countries. However, uh, what schools further made done and what was identified, the first thing is not related to the, but mostly mentioned, it's not related directly to uh, education process, is how actually to monitor and implement health protection measures. For all the you know uh, schools, uh, it seems like it's it, it's a huge problem. Uh, the second one is directly related to uh, teaching and learning process because all of the uh, teachers and the school directors in all the type of schools said that planning and organizing, not implementing itself, of the distance learning is a huge challenge, and that. that this is the area they we need to work together in order to improve it. And the third is a more complex one. And it even it seems like that it's you know just a technical issue because uh, we call it widely, you know, uh, lack of equipment. Uh, so many other challenges is connected with it. Lack of equipment at the first place means that so many students actually haven't had um, access to the learning, to the distance learning. So schools needed to find some other more traditional ways. Even according to some other research data, uh, it seems like that TV lessons are, you know, not enough. That the printing materials and delivering to students is not also enough. So uh, schools and actually system can do in the future uh, something regarding to establishing some system of inclusion of those students and mostly from vulnerable groups 
for it, do not have access to the equipment as well as to the internet connection. And just a small footnote regarding to uh, Jana and Batia said, you know, uh, we still don't have, uh, even we have some mechanisms for the early warning and intervention systems when dropout, you know, uh, is happening. Uh, we still don't know, even uh, our assessment is that this crisis and the lack of equipment and internet connection will have influence not just on the knowledge loss, but as well as on dropout. We are expecting that it's going to be huge. And it's great to see that there were some initiatives regarding the establishing of the learning clubs. Uh, since in Serbia at this very moment, some voices are very loud in advocacy of establishing of the learning clubs as to one of the solutions uh, for the situation not maybe for the extracurricular activities, but rather as a kind of the homework uh, clubs or, or remedial teaching clubs. So I hope so for the next conference, we will, we will know how such a clubs are working in our environment. Thank you, Astminka. Um, Jana, Batya, any examples from your countries of what has been done in the crisis or, or, or how system has prepared? Just a quick reflection of what Yasmin has shared with us, if you have. Jana, go ahead. Mm, um, yes, well, in Estonia, I think we can't, uh, can't uh, talk that much about technical issues that we don't have internet access, well, we don't have computers, also uh, electronic platforms. Actually, the access is pretty good. I think the, the technical like the preparedness for this distance learning is actually very good. So I just wanted to point out maybe one, I wouldn't say positive effect of the crisis, but uh, but the possibility of the crisis. Uh, we have talk, talked in Estonia for years about uh, the importance of e-schooling and uh, electronic platforms, how to use different uh, uh, IT tools in order to improve the stu uh, study process. And actually, uh, it, it's still now, the, or this, it, this has been now the moment when the teachers and the students actually have had to use these tools. And we see that uh, even though we have talked about, the, about these tools for years, uh, there is a quite a big lack in in the skills and uh, and the motivation to use them. So I just hope that uh, it kind of improves these skills now. That it is a uh, kind of motivates teachers to to improve themselves in IT and then to use different platforms and, and tools. I think it's. It, it still has potential as well. It's not only all, like entirely negative uh, all this uh, this experience on, on distance learning. So I, yeah, from our like point of view or, or uh, the point of view from our project, I think in these very messy times, I, I hope that this alarm bell helps to um, or support uh, teachers. Uh, uh, again, in, in, in the identification of, of potential problems in early phases. So that's Thank my answer. Thank you, Of course, we're not surprised that Estonia had all the equipment. <laughs> As an e-country of, of our region, definitely, uh, and not only in the region. But yeah, interesting that uh, this has actually motivated, uh, or they were forced to start being motivated to use all the availability that they do have. Batya from, from Mongolia? So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about a quarter of students were not able to uh, have access to different types of online uh, learning uh, opportunities. So, uh, this um, the crisis uh, has made it even more clear that the the, the marginalized and at risk uh, groups, uh, uh, the situation of them even got. Uh, even worse. Um, so, um, so for instance, the children of the nomadic herder families, um, uh, children with disabilities or uh, special educational needs, uh, children from poorer families, especially 
from uh, from the uh, outskirt areas of the capital city. Uh, so there were, the, the schools identified uh, children living in families even without uh, electricity at all, not to talk about uh, gadgets, gadgets, devices, or even TV. Uh, so, um, uh, so based on that, the uh, one of the things that the current uh, ministry is trying to do is they are trying to look at the picture, uh, the bigger picture, and uh, part in the last during the last summer, they set up a, a quite big. Uh, working group consists of different uh, agencies, including Institute of Education, uh, Institute for um, Teacher Professional Development, plus uh, NGOs, uh, to develop a comprehensive plan, a three-year pro program, to um, uh, address the learning loss and support student learning. And they've managed to uh, bring in all the development partners on board. And uh, now it is, the plan uh, is approved and it is uh, in the process of starting and uh, addressing these issues. And one of the issues is that uh, the um, blended learning uh, is going to be uh, a focus and also trying to look at more at student-centered learning, individualization and differentiation in learning, so. Okay, yeah. thank you, Katya. Uh, we move back to Jana now and, and to see, uh, you talked about uh, what you're trying to do with the, with the nudging system and trying to have the alarm bell. Um, and um, you are concentrating, I, I would say that, you know, so um, we said that the pandemic made the position of vulnerable groups, of course, even more vulnerable. Um, and your initiative is focused on dropout of low SES students. Um, do you know any examples where this has been used before uh, for dropouts in different systems that you can share with us? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, notching uh, is becoming like increasingly popular in in, the, in all policy fields, and the educational sector is not uh, not exemption in this regard. So yes, there are like notching has been used uh, in many many ways. Uh, for example, um, defaults and framing and goal setting reminders. Like uh, this is all can be notching. Uh, like I said, we used social comparison and social norm. Yes, it, it has been used uh, with very different results. Um, for example, I remember like one study that investigated like how um, uh, how uh, giving feedback about the best performance in the class uh, results the, the overall average in the class. So this actually produced the negative effect that the average came lower because uh, the best performance saw that the social norm is different and they didn't like they, their performance uh, decreased so it can produce like very very different effects and in this sense we have to be very careful how to apply this knowledge and social social norm uh, in our uh, in our study I think what is uh, slightly different in in our case is that we are not addressing uh, the message to the uh, to the student which is usually done. Uh, we kind of had it in, in our heads and, and then we thought about it, but for now we decided to send it only to the teacher because we thought that, okay, these are uh, people in a very, um, maybe a fragile um, age, uh, teenagers, some might have problems, some have a uh, like very difficult socioeconomic background. So getting a message about like how uh, he or she is uh, deviate from the class average, or that uh, he or she is worse than, than others in the class doesn't doesn't motivate. I would I would uh, think. <laughs> so yeah, the information is is uh, directed to the teacher who decides uh, like whether whether it is a real problem. Maybe sometimes it can be a technical 
problem or maybe the teacher hasn't uh, inserted uh, relevant information to the system so it's kind of a mis uh, miswarning and in this sense uh, in this case the teacher can uh, can uh, close the, the warning and, and the alarm um, yeah, but when coming back to the notches, then um, uh, I think the closest uh, intervention, which is not entirely knowledge based, but the in intervention as such has been used in the US, that is collect, check and connect, uh, that also uh, tried uh, to identify uh, the students uh, in a drop out risk and uh, then to, to kind of nudge the um, uh, teachers to, to uh, get in connection with them and then talk to, to talk to them like about their potential problems. But the difference here uh, with our project is that we use this big data and digitalized information systems and, and data. But in, in original form, uh, this check and connect was done manually. So uh, this is this is the main difference. Okay, thank you. I think it's a very interesting initiative because on one hand, one would think, one would think that the teacher should notice these things without the nudging system. <laughs> but uh, let's hope that uh, that this will help. Uh, and I guess warning others in school uh, is is an interesting it's an interesting um, idea. So let's see how it works. I'm really glad you're not telling the students that they're doing worse than the average in their classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, let's see, let's see how it works. But uh, we're really excited to see the results of the pilot study when they're out, so it will be interesting. But yeah, tell us about the topics and, and the, the, what did the students really raise uh, through their journalist clubs? I think that's interesting for us to hear. Okay, so... Um... Uh, during the initial training, uh, we uh, started the conversation with the students uh, because there were only two students from a school uh, about what are the current issues that students have. And then they uh, were asked to continue this discussion when they go back to school, uh, to their schools and um, go back <laughs> to their schools. and. <laughs> um, and discuss with their uh, club members uh, and they came up with different issues so i have a list of issues here uh, so first one is um, uh, quite a uh, big issue uh, the COVID situation and uh, the children's right to education a large topic uh, students voice uh, uh, and uh, views and the ways of uh, 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 listening to the students' voices and how to ensure student particip participation. Um, uh, the uh, uh, healthy lifestyle, especially uh, you know, doing more exercise and uh, movements, especially during the school closures. Uh, uh, another issue was uh, how to prevent from um, peer uh, pressure, peer bullying, because it is one of the issues that is uh, uh, coming up quite often and more so on uh, media. Uh, uh, online environment and child development um, and uh, the uh, other topic was about uh, environmental protection green future and how what can students do to uh, around that and uh, also uh, the um, kind of uh, questionnaires and other uh, means to identify what students want to have on the newspaper. So these were the issues that uh, students had. And uh, uh, I think we've shared the 
uh, Google Drive where uh, we have some examples of school uh, newspapers and now uh, some uh, the clubs are uh, either uh, having print newspapers or online versions of newspapers so we can uh, we can get uh, more updates on what other issues they are talking about uh, these days. Thank you, Batya. This is actually a good time that I also mentioned that in the following days we will have little videos of all our emergency funds uh, coming out on our social media uh, and we'll be sharing them with you during the conference as well. We have one from students in Mongolia uh, who talk about how, how this works and, and, and uh, uh, what issues they've raised. I find it very interesting that actually the, the issues they raised, um, like the right to education and how COVID has affected that is, is, is crucial for their lives. I can understand that they would be concerned with. Um, and I'm, I mean, all of the topics that they've raised are actually very actual and, and very, very important. Um, and for me, the question is then for both Yasminka and, and Jana, uh, what happens with student voice in your countries? Do we have any any good examples of something that is being done in Aspinka? Well, nothing systemic and nothing related to the big scale research, uh, as it should be, I suppose, because now 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 we are in in pandemic time, you know, for 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 around two years. Uh, however, Ministry of Education, Institute for Psychology and uh, UNICEF actually done one uh, research that it's uh, related to uh, monitoring uh, of participation and learning uh, of students from vulnerable groups, which is of particular interest for uh, all of us, as well as uh, the Network of Organization for Children of Serbia actually uh, done very good one that covers uh, children's satisfaction with the online learning, uh, parents' abilities to support students at home uh, if online uh, learning is not of the quality they find adequate, and uh, dedicated to identification of the specific challenges regarding to the distance learning. Uh, also, UNICEF uh, done something they are calling U Report that covers not not just the students uh, in primary and secondary education, but as well as students in higher education uh, uh, institutions on uh, how students organize their their self and again what uh, are the biggest challenges for them in in uh, online uh, learning. So. Uh, you know, speaking about specific challenges and uh, what they found, uh, actually that uh, students are in general not not satisfied with uh, with uh, online uh, learning, and not just in the way how it's organized, but as well as what teachers are requests from the students and what they are providing, what the teachers are providing in, in, in uh, those times. Uh, even I haven't mentioned uh, before, but now I'm mentioning even teachers are actually uh, underlining that they are under the huge stress. And that, you know, for them, uh, this is one, you know, stress and frustration uh, which came with this new situation is something that prevents them to take care much more about students' learning and the students' needs. And um, Again, something interesting is that students confess actually that they are not, you know, self-organized enough, that they learn from this situation that they need to improve their, uh, you know, self-regulation and self-learning and self-organizational skills. Thank you, Yasminka. Very interesting uh, points there. Um, uh, I wonder if they learn how to self-organize with somehow our support or at least uh, a willingness to listen to them. Uh, but yes, some, some, some let's say, uh, yes. moves. You know, for us, you know, we, we discussed, you know, internally about such results. And, and uh, for us, it means in general, that teachers, even without, you know, pandemic or before pandemic, 
uh, are still much more trapped in the traditional styles of teaching. So that uh, self-regulation of learning is not something that teachers usually are, you know, developing with the students and insist on it. So it's still rather teachers are still not, uh, you know, facilitators of the process, but still they perceive themselves as someone who is, you know, interpreting and, uh, you know, sending information to students. So definitely this is evergreen problem, not just the, the one uh, related to pandemic, but now appears it's a very much important. Thank you very much. Again, another proof that pandemic has just been like a, a litmus paper for actual situation um, in schools and in, in the system in general. Jana, what about student voice in Estonia? Any good? Uh, stories there. Uh, well, I, I think uh, in Estonia, the students' voices uh, and different institutions and channels to hear these voices are pretty well established. I would say there is, for example, a uh, Union of Estonian Student Council. There are also the Estonian National, uh, National Youth Council which are pretty strong NGOs and which are like engage, uh, engaged in the, in the, in the policymaking process on a regular basis, actually. So through these organizations, which actually have their um, connection with individual schools and, and uh, individual students, they, they kind of can channel their, uh, their worries during the times of crisis now, during the pandemics, but in, in more general questions as well. Um, like other uh, other aspects, for example, the you, uh, young people can hack and vote uh, in municipal elections when they are 16. So I think this is also one way to express uh, their opinions and worries and and uh, kind of influence the, the uh, decisions and, and politics uh, uh, that is made. And also, yes, there there are some very recent studies as well, like how the pandemic has influenced the situation of, of young people, especially in terms of uh, 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 mental well-being and, and uh, occupation. And of course, it, I'm not the best, best person to talk about the study, but uh, but it brought out like uh, some negative uh, negative effects, of course, that uh, young people had uh, or experienced more severely compared with uh, other uh, age groups, for example. But in general terms, I would say that uh, that uh, young people can express their uh, opinions quite well. Thank you very much, Jana. Yes, uh, our study that we did in Estonia also showed that uh, there is uh, more space and more support for student voices in Estonia uh, than we have in our region. We do have these unions and then school boards and uh, student boards in schools in almost all countries. However, how implemented they are and whether they we listen to them and who gets into the boards, um, I think is also a big issue for our countries. So the support to student voice um, it's interesting that it came out at the end of this session as well as at the end of the last session. Um, thank you for the speakers, but I would like to open for any comments or questions that uh, the audience might have before we close this session. Uh, we are right on time, but I'm sure everybody could spare another five to ten minutes if there is questions or, or comments that anybody would like to share. You could write it in a comment or just uh, start speaking, uh, everything is fine. I think Ulvi is trying to say something. <laughs> Do you want, no? You can turn on your mic if you want. I, I just would like to, to share my some general comment that uh, the presentations we hear, the experience we heard today, it's really a, a perfect match with what NEPS is doing. And with, with the goal of conferences to understand uh, the contributions of countries in these crisis situations and the opportunities existing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivia. Yes, we, we are very proud of our membership. Fast reaction to, 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 to the emergency that arised and everything that was done in, in different countries through the emergency funds, but also without the emergency funds. A lot has been going on. Um, and yes, we tried to showcase it today. 
So as there doesn't seem to be other questions and comments, I will close this panel for now. Thank you again to Yasmin, Kayana and Batia for their uh, experiences in sharing uh, their projects. To everybody who participated and listened, um, we will continue the conference with the session at 12.30 Central European time, so in an hour, uh, with a panel on inclusion and uh, we're waiting for you there. Thank you again. Um, and see you in an hour for those who are joining us. Goodbye. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, know me, I am Iva Perkovic uh, from uh, NEPTS team, and I'd like to welcome you all, all to our uh, final panel of uh, our first day of the conference. Uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, this uh, session will also be uh, recorded. So if you don't want to be uh, on the recording, I kindly uh, ask you to turn off your camera. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, you can write them uh, in a chat and uh, we will address it uh, later. So I will be uh, uh, your moderator uh, for today and uh, today we will discuss uh, the inequality and inclusion uh, based on the experience from the projects we here at TNEPS are participating either as uh, partners or uh, leaders but uh, that all have in common addressing this issue of inequality and a strong focus on inclusion and participation. Uh, we have also different uh, dimensions in this project, as you will see, uh, but uh, as I said, strong emphasis on the inclusion, participation and uh, uh, inequality. So uh, let me introduce to you uh, our speakers uh, and panelists for today. Uh, we have here uh, Sanja Brajkovic from the Open Academy, uh, step by step from Croatia. Welcome, Sanja. Uh, Sanya will uh, represent uh, HEAD project, uh, HEAD uh, Empowering School Principles for Inclusive School Culture, uh, that's the full name of the project, and uh, HEAD project is actually led by NEPTS, uh, and it is focused on, the inclusive, on inclusive education through the professional development of the school principles. It uh, takes uh, and exploits best practices from uh, Slovenia and uh, the Netherlands and uh, pilots them in 60 schools in uh, Croatia and North Macedonia. Uh, we also have here uh, uh, Vishna Pavlovic from the Forum for Freedom uh, in Education from Croatia. Welcome, Vishna. Uh, Vishnu will uh, represent the Start the Change project uh, that is uh, led by Forum for Freedom uh, in uh, Education and it is focused on creating the uh, generation of uh, uh, change makers uh, through intercultural education and volunteering with the ultimate goal of preventing and combating uh, radicalization ext and extremism among young people. Um, uh, finally, we also have today uh, Petri Tahiri from the Kosovo Education uh, Center. Uh, welcome, Petri. Uh, Petri will uh, share with us uh, his experience as a leader of the uh, RIS Action for Reducing Inequalities in Education project. Uh, that's uh, the project is focused on supporting schools, grassroots organizations, uh, community, and policymakers in developing actions. Uh, and uh, policies uh, aim at uh, mitigating the effects of uh, low socioeconomic status uh, on the students' achievement, but also uh, in, in the final goal of reducing the inequalities in education. Uh, thank you everyone for accepting the uh, invitation and welcome once again. Uh, I uh, hope we will have a fruitful <laughs> and inspiring discussion. Uh, and uh, I think we can uh, begin with the first question that uh, is perhaps a bit complex, uh, but I think it is uh, necessary for uh, setting the stage and uh, providing us with the better overview of the uh, situation in, in our education uh, systems. So I will start with you, Petrit. Uh, as in the RIs, one of the main uh, initial outputs uh, was the comparative report that uh, underlined uh, the inclusion and equity issues in the participating countries. 
uh, and demonstrated what countries can do to support uh, not only low CES but uh, all students. Uh, could you possibly uh, summarize for us what were the main challenges that were uh, recognized uh, regarding the inclusion and uh, participation on this uh, system level? Okay, thank you, Eva, for a nice presentation of all of us. And uh, dear all, it's nice to uh, have this opportunity to discuss with you uh, about our uh, joint ongoing project. Uh, as you uh, understood, the name of the project is Arise, Action for Reducing Inequalities in Education. Uh, this project is... Uh, implemented by uh, a consortium of eight organizations from that are part of NEPS. And we are absolutely uh, uh, happy that on behalf of NEPS, we are tackling such an important issues such as uh, this inequality in education. Uh, maybe it will be good to, uh, for all of you just to say some words about the project because now we are somehow in the middle of uh, the implementation of the project and it's uh, uh, good to uh, give some key information about the project. So uh, Action for Reducing Inequalities in Education is a project that uh, is a kind of uh, non-formal network of eight organization from NEPTS and the main uh, objective is to strengthen the capacities of uh, civil society organization for policy development and advocacy in the area of educational equity through regional cooperation and building national coalitions. Uh, the project have initiated by NEPTS and on the way we have jointly developed this idea and now we as Kosovo Education Center are leading the consortium but uh, every activity is uh, well uh, divided or uh, uh, disseminated in all six countries of uh, Western Balkan countries plus uh, Turkey, who is our uh, partner as well. Uh, one of the key challenge in the beginning of this project is that we have kicked off the project on 9th of March 2020, just a week before the lockdown. So imagine a regional project that uh, main activities were focused on uh, regional cooperation regional meetings regional trainings and activities to be started in covid time when we were uh, locked in in our homes and working uh, in in distance uh, but uh, with the our commitments and with a very good understanding from all our partners, we achieved to uh, convert and adapt all activities on online mode. And uh, since 9th of April, we have started uh, implementation of activities. All activities are uh, in uh, are packed in four working packages. And uh, the first working package is uh, policy analysis and research. The second one is uh, uh, the policy outreach and advocacy. The third one is consortium learning. And the fourth one is school intervention. Why I'm uh, sharing with you this information because we uh want to uh to share with you also the levels of uh working and the levels levels of intervention the first one working package one was uh planned and already done in the first year of the project during 2020 planned to have 
uh, six or to develop six national reports on uh, equality uh, uh, and inequality in education with a special focus on low SES children. Then uh, all these six reports, uh, just for your information, uh, reports are from Kosovo, Serbia, Albania, uh, uh, Macedonia, Bosnia, and Turkey. This six reports then uh, brought together in one comparative report. And today I will share some of the key findings of this comparative uh, report. Uh, the second objective or second working package component is policy outreach. And we are happy that NEPTS is leading this uh, component because of uh, their experience and also because we are uh, thinking or we, that through this component we will achieve to address all issues identified through the working package one, through national reports, through research, we can address structurally to the policy makers through establishing national coalitions and regional policy lab. The third component is uh, a development of the uh, members of the consortium. So all eight organizations from NEPTS, plus we have six grassroots organizations that are part of the project now from each country, uh, one grassroots organization. So we have two levels of uh, the consortium learning. One is uh, learning between us as NEPTS uh, members, and the other is with uh, six grassroots organizations that we are working jointly on addressing uh, issues that were identified as part of working package one. And the fourth component, now, if you, you can just visualize this in your head from uh, research findings, working on policy making uh, and poli with policy makers. And the fourth component is going directly to schools and try to work uh, concretely and implement concretely something in schools. Within this component, we have selected 25 schools among uh, five countries in the region uh, and on each selected school from now on till end of 2023 we will support schools to first adopt their school action uh, sdp school development plan to align with uh, specifics on addressing issues uh, raised by the reports and with a specific focus on addressing issues on inequalities in education. So this is how the project is uh, uh, planned and uh, now as I said before we are on the second year of the implementation and we are uh, considering the circumstances and the situation with COVID, uh, I can say that we are very happy uh, on the progress that we achieved until until now. Now, uh, uh, this was as an introduction about the project. Just let me shortly to uh, mention some of the key uh, findings that we uh, identified uh, with the national reports and with the uh, comparative report. So, the first thing is that all countries, or as a conclusion of, of, of the, the reports, all countries have made progress towards the establishment of inclusive education. Uh, also, they put it high on the policy agenda. But, Despite the strong commitment to the idea of inclusive education, financial funds are not sufficient. Education staff is not always fully trained and communication between different stakeholders needs to be improved 
in and some forms of separate provisions are still present in countries for example based on disabilities or on language spoken and and so on uh, another important uh, recommendation or a finding from the report is that uh, we have uh, quite good <laughs> legislation uh, on, on national levels, but also uh, within these uh, uh, different laws and policies, uh, there are differences in how they conceptualize the uh, equality and equity. For instance, some conceptualize it as equal rights whereas others as the absence of discrimination. Discrimination against specific groups is prohibited in all countries, and they all have a, a definition of inclusion uh, that embraces multiple social groups, but some lists are more comprehensive than others. Uh, then, another conclusion from the reports are that uh, this good legislative framework that exists uh, in all countries uh, remain disconnected from the realities in everyday school practice. And uh, I wanted to say earlier when Lana presented, uh, we we can we have or our key recommendation will be we have to develop policies how to implement policies so so we have to uh it's kind of developing uh, guidelines how to implement guidelines so uh, th 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 this is this is the situation that we are on uh, all countries has absolutely very good uh, legislative framework but it is a, a big discrepancy what is written in these uh, laws policies and what is the reality in uh, in school uh, also uh, lana mentioned many times on on her introduction the importance of uh, inclusive curriculum or the curriculum itself and uh, we have to have in inclusive curriculum is equally important as inclusive policies and infrastructure so we have to have uh, a more inclusive curriculum in our schools another key finding is that uh, there is a mismatch or a, a lack of uh, intersectional co collaboration uh, in in all levels uh, this lack of collaboration is within uh, national institutions, for example, ministries, but also between the uh, national and local uh, governments. Uh, there are some other, other uh, findings, but I think that uh, these that I, I wanted to share with you until now are the, the key ones that we have to uh be focused in uh, next uh, uh, work within the arise project last thing that i want to to mention uh, because the time is going is flying is uh, the importance of uh, working directly in schools working on changing the climate in our schools so inequalities uh, can be addressed not only through uh, good uh, government policies and through different affirmative measures on uh, poverty and so on, but it is the most important thing from my point of view is how we can uh, establish or create an, a climate, an environment in our schools that uh creates uh the, the equal possibilities for all children in uh 
school. And for this, we have to have a trained teacher, well-prepared teacher, and also move our head from this uh, paradigm of treating equally all. Uh, we have to treat all based on their needs, not to treat them all equally. So, yeah, this is it from my side now, and I hope that uh, there will be some comments and questions, and I'm ready to uh, answer or respond on this. Thank you, Eva, and thank you all for listening to me. Thank you for your attention. Um... Thank you, Petrit, for this uh, comprehensive overview. Uh, we have heard that uh, actually we have a big problem as it looks like uh, that uh, we have a good uh, legislation uh, background, but uh, uh, in practice uh, the things aren't functioning uh, uh, as they should. And uh, regarding this uh, gap uh, uh, that happens, uh, let's now move uh, uh, just to this practic uh, practice level. Uh, so uh, I will uh, ask you, Sanya, uh, as part of the head project, you uh, it, uh, the analysis actually was conducted on the school principal needs. So could you? Uh, perhaps share with us uh, what were the main challenges uh, for the inclusive school uh, culture from their perspective. So we have heard now uh, 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 a great overview of the situation uh, on this systematic and uh, legislative level. And uh, can you tell us something uh, about how it looks in the practice? Yes. So within the project, um, two actually, let's say, studies were done. One is about uh, the, um, the leaders' needs, and another one is about the inclusive climate in, in their uh, their school. So it, it was about the rate of inclusive, let's say, uh, climate in their schools. Maybe we should also mention why we, we are working with leaders, since we know that actually they are not tackling so much practice. Or uh, we know from many studies that actually they do not uh, how to say direct uh, influence on, for example, uh, children challenges, children learning, and so on. But what actually they can do as a leaders and as uh, principals, they can change the climate in the school. They can um, influence on the development of the inclusive climate in the schools. And inclusive climate in the schools actually can change the um, uh, the the outcomes of the children, not just the cognitive outcomes, but also social and emotional outcomes. And that was the reason why we choose together with NEPS, of course, is to actually to, to work on, on uh, this topic and to help actually uh, leaders, school leaders, to develop inclusive climate in their schools. Regarding their needs, we can say overall, overall like conclusion was that they need uh, how to say more focused professional development events and uh, professional development, uh, how to say training, seminars, and so on, when they can build their skills and their uh, competencies together with other, um, other principles. Since we know, for example, in Croatia, when they, uh, they participate on those kind of trainings, they mostly get some knowledge about management of the schools and management of the schools do not directly uh, connect it with the uh, building inclusive uh, climate of the school. What we also did uh, at the beginning of the project or the implementation part of the project is that one study was conducted in all schools which are uh, and with all principals, their pupils and teachers in that schools who are uh, participating in the project, but also we have control group. And at the end of the project, we'll be, we, we are repeating the same study, the same research, and we will see actually how we impact on, uh, what is the impact on their schools. So what are the results of this first study, baseline, let's say baseline study? The, the question here uh, has four parts. Uh, and First part is democratic school leadership. We 
we tried to identify is there some kind of democratic school leadership, how it is the perception of the school leaders and also teachers. Then the second one was the cooperation with the stakeholders. The third one was the presence of inclusive school policies and how they are implemented. And the th uh, fourth part was awareness of challenges uh, which they are facing in, in their schools. So regarding the first area, which was um, about democratic school leadership, what was the, the overall conclusion that, that everybody like and principals and teachers are aware the importance of democratic uh, kind of leadership in their schools? And uh, they said, okay, we, we know that, that it is important, and also, when you are comparing with the other areas, we can say overall that it, it is the uh, area which is rated the most, most highly, let's say. But what is in, when, when you are looking on the items, let's say, and this is my impression or my reflection, is what they appreciate are rules, boundaries, you know, uh, to have like uh, clear examples what do you should do and so on. And you will see when we connect this part with the fourth and uh, third part of this questionnaire, which is uh, talking about um, recognition of those who are part of the minorities and they are not recognized. And actually those who are, how to say, uh, put, put it on the aside in their schools, so pupils who are put aside on their schools, then we can actually think about is that democratic part of the leaders, democratic way of, of uh, school leadership, or maybe it is something else. It seems that maybe we have just, you know, boundaries and rules, but without vision how we will actually uh, make uh, our schools more inclusive. Regarding the area of cooperation with stakeholders, it was the same as Patrick just mentioned. Uh, teachers even said that, uh, um, that they are not motivated by the, their principals and school uh, leaders to, uh, to cooperate with the, with the parents. We also have to have in mind that uh, the study was done at the beginning of the, uh, at the, beginning of the COVID crisis. But uh, also their perception was that they almost at all very, so the cooperation with other stakeholders are very low, especially for teachers. Uh, principals also during the training recognize that they are not, they do not cooperate with institutions in the local community. So they are, and also that there is no uh, intersectorial cooperation as Pat Patrick uh, mentioned on the horizontal level or uh, on the vertical level. Uh, uh, I just mentioned that regarding the inclusive school politics, they, uh, and it was also said during the training because they are reflected a lot, is that they actually recognized that they do not follow uh, which uh, uh, what children actually are uh, children in risk, minority children, and what kind of uh, additional uh, uh, additional help or uh, some kind of other kind of instructions those children need. Uh, also, what is the perception of teachers? They do they so overall they do not um, um, so they need lots of more, let's say, help or professional development events, or for example, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cooperation regarding uh, children who are uh, minority children or children in risk. And at the end, which is connected with the fourth part of this, uh, that questionnaire, is that they, they do not actually, in, in most cases, they uh, do not monitor any data and they do not planning according to the data they actually collect on, on their schools. So we can conclude, yes, we have kind of democratic school leadership, but actually we do not, uh, we do not see, we, do not, we are not focused on those uh, who need those kind of 
uh, democratic leadership and it seems that it is just the way how we are functioning but we are not focused on the uh, why we are doing this yeah. uh, thank you thank you sanya uh, it is interesting how uh, this uh, problems are uh, basically uh, uh, similar uh, both on the system and then transferred on the on the school level uh, uh, let's focus now on the students perspective uh, which one of the uh, early inputs uh, or outputs in the start of change uh, uh, project was the comparative uh, report on the students voice and needs uh, can you present to us shortly uh, what were the main challenges that students uh, from Croatia, Portugal and uh, North Macedonia recognized? Are there any similarities with what we've uh, heard uh, so far? Uh, thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, in terms of the comparative report, uh, yeah, I would like to maybe firstly share that in though our focus of the of the research was to to, to find out uh, students perspective on inclusion and participation possibilities in, in in the schools that we as as project coordinators and consortium members really faced with the challenge on how how to um, implement uh, the focus groups with students in order to to ensure inclusion and participation of good representations of students in the time of the COVID and lockdown. So uh, it, it, it really uh, helped us actually, though it's uh, with every crisis, I think it also provides the opportunity to learn something. So it really helped us actually to go uh, as, a, as a consortium uh, uh, deeper in, in what it means, really inclusion and participation and the voice of students and why is it important to think about um, uh, the, the methods and approach and, and, and what is the substantial or significant student's voice um, and also how to ensure good representations of all voices in, in, in let's say, acoustic of, of, of one school or, or the school culture uh, uh, or, or in order to ensure democratic culture, let's say, in the school as, as, as it was already mentioned. Um, and with that in mind, the researchers in three countries, uh, with of course some postponement and, and, and uh, going uh, beyond the set deadlines, uh, uh, we managed to implement uh, uh, 30 focus groups in 15 schools. And the persp perspective of students, um, I, I might say it was not su surprising for us, probably it's not surprising for you that uh, they mostly, um, in conclusion, students shared uh, challenges and obstacles and um, actually experience of not being uh, heard, uh, that even if they are uh, being heard, that the, uh, they've been heard by the teachers who also didn't have or felt that they don't have a power to, to respond to their needs or to make some changes. Um, it, it seems like, and th th this was the conclusion of authors, that uh, within the school that there is already by default uh, certain rules uh, and, and students recognize them that are fixed and not open to, to their, let's say, needs um, and perspectives that they would like to change. Of course, there is another part of students, um, let's say, um, change in attitude which they explain with the attitude of, of teachers as well, which is not, uh, which is uh, like, uh, they are not able to change anything. In secondary schools, usually the perspective is, we are here for four years and we will go on, which corresponds also with some of the perspectives of teachers that we interviewed uh, as, as also one of our activities which is uh, in, in, in secondary schools, uh, yeah, we have every generation of students who are uh, mentioning the same complaints, but we are limited by the rules that we have, and, and it's really, really hard to change. So um, let's say the key recommendation from the comparative report uh, was, uh, again, uh, something that, uh, that, that was, I think, also recognized by, by previous colleagues, uh, which is, <laughs> How do we work on quality communication? And then even if we have a quality communication, how we can ensure the encouraging space 
where all stakeholders can have a voice, can have experience of being heard, and can have a space where some of the changes can really take place. Because the alternative to that, uh, it seems like uh, from, from students and from teachers is status quo and, and no change, no change at all. So within the our project, which is called accidentally maybe, maybe not start the change, we are actually uh, uh, yeah, trying to explore together with teachers of 15 schools how we can really employ like whole school approach and that there could be a space where uh, voice of both students but also voice of teachers can be something regarded as, as significant and important that uh, yeah I, I wouldn't take maybe a longer time but uh, yeah that in in the first year of the project that we really then together with teachers uh, all, all of us partners worked really hard in in building resources and training curriculum in, in which we revisited what it means to to have a voice in, in in school and how that can be related to teaching and to teaching curriculum that then that is related to student backgrounds and and their um let's say communities that they come come from so it's, it's related to their really life um and also maybe just to mention that uh, we have uh, in, in a third year that is um, in front of us a strong hopefully uh, uh, also significant uh, policy comp component then uh, that we will hopefully uh, uh, yeah have possibilities to 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 contribute to to this uh, change on on policy um, thank you Vishnya. thank you all i think uh, uh, we from what uh, i heard that uh, we now have uh, not so um, optimistic, but a nice overview of the situation where we saw how uh, problems from systemic level transfer and spill over to this uh, practical school level, and uh, which is also reflected as we heard now from Vishnya uh, on the students as well, uh, where, where they don't feel like they are heard. Uh, and uh, as you said, Vishna, uh, uh, you, you uh, uh, asked the question, how can we help, how can we uh, empower them? Uh, so uh, I would uh, ask you, uh, perhaps uh, Vishna, you can continue, uh, about how are you uh, improving uh, uh, these things and empowering uh, uh, students and teachers and uh, school staff throughout uh, your projects, uh, throughout all these dimensions? uh perhaps you can you can mention some of the concrete uh, uh, examples from uh from from the project uh yes uh, so in the first year what we what we uh i think the all partners focus the most uh, beside the challenges of organizing uh, the, the the teacher training was um, creating curriculum and then uh, together with uh, teachers actually exploring what the student voice really means and how to, to include and how to empower students for active participation. And I think that uh, in, in the experience of, of all partners, what was important was um, actually tackling our own perspective as adults. Uh, like, what does it mean to have a voice for us? Did we always have a voice? When we didn't have a voice, how did it felt? Uh, just, just uh, trying to find find out the meaning uh, of of voice for us as as an adults, and uh, let's say um, uh, how how and what uh, context, what what kind of support helped us to really find our own voice. And I think it really clicked with teachers and just exploring also for them themselves personally. And then uh, again, going back to students, like what is the space in school that we can provide that students can really have a voice? And what does it mean? Uh, do, we, do we just only like listen to students, invite them to say, uh, and what, what could be the next steps? And this also kind of uh, helped teachers to, to identify all space in the school where they can uh, students can be supported to give their perspective and then again to ensure the audience or the space or um, 
or or the the the, the concrete change that they could uh, take on themselves and and really uh, get some get some uh, actual actual change and for students of course to ensure this experience of them yes we can be heard we can do some change and what we say matters even if some problems that they're pointing out cannot be solved but just by being heard being um, um, give, giving given explanation and, and, and really showing understanding and empathy for their problems that it really it really helps in changing this culture so some of the concrete examples uh, so I will mention those from Croatia though if we had more time definitely the, the there are interesting uh, examples and volunteering activities and initiatives and projects in North Macedonia and Portugal. Uh, one is for, from a primary school uh, where we had uh, a teacher uh, who, together with a group of students, actually, uh, she uh, decided to, um, to, to continue to work with, uh, with students from the focus group in in in, in uh, previously mentioned mentioned activities so just to, to have this experience okay you shared with uh, researchers your perspective and uh, identified problems and then the teacher from the same school continued to work with the, the, those group of students and trying to tackling different different issues that mentioned and what was interesting with that school uh, with that teacher and with that group that they actually decided to include those students who are of different uh, grades and ages uh, is actually to to uh, give opportunity for those students to change policy documents of the school so this was really interesting uh, experience i think for the school for those students definitely and also for us just giving uh, one, one good practice example. So one of the first documents, and they will continue, that they addressed uh, was uh, student uh, the, the stu uh, student award of the final year, like who is the best student uh, in, in the end of the primary school, who was usually uh, provoked among students feeling of, in, let's say, injustice. They, don't, they, they sometimes were not so, so happy with it because usually it was the recommendation of one or two teachers or the usually best academically best 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 students so the the students in this group they designed the criteria indicators and they uh, expanded the criteria from academic to also a student who is active who is supportive who is uh, let's say um, active in, in uh, different extracurriculum activities um and and uh, uh this really presented uh they the group presented this uh de their document to the all teachers and then to to uh their own classrooms and adjusted so they, they try to include the, the the voices of of all school and now they they are happy with, with this document and now they will start with with uh, other other school documents so this this uh they called they titled themselves reformators i think it's really uh, in the indicator i think particularly for croatia to have this to have this group of students uh another another project if i'm not taking too much time i, I will just go quickly because i think it's important to mention the the, the secondary school uh vocational schools where students were looking for more uh, more let's say empathy from teachers to, to, to have a feeling that teachers understand their issues. They symbolically call their project uh, Walk in My Shoes. And uh, so we worked with those uh, school team and uh, they, they were really, let's say, open. And this project gave them the space to organize what they also recognize as necessary. So they organized a um, platform. It was meant to be alive, but it was online where this group of uh, students from focus groups actually identified and shared the different issues and problems in front of the school principals and, and some other key teachers uh, and uh, sometimes that they they shared uh, in in their reports uh, some problems have been solved and some problems have been discussed and that already mattered mattered to them and they could like students of course have capacity to understand also these limitations of the of the, of the system. 
So these are just a few few examples on on uh, yeah with some effort how the, the 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 school culture because for for those two schools this really meant a change in in a school a school culture uh, uh, not only for students but for those teachers. Thank you, Vishnya. Uh, those are uh, really uh, great and uh, inspiring, uh, and I think really relevant uh, relevant examples. And I think they can't uh, be implemented without the support of the school uh, principals. So I would uh, ask Sanya if she could perhaps share with us uh, uh, experiences from the head project and uh, how can we, uh, uh, how are you working with, with the school leaders uh, to uh, make this shift from, from managers bound in, in boundaries and, and the rules to, to pedagogical uh, leaders who are supporting and empowering students. Uh, so maybe the main i I'm, I'm not sure if the, it is the main uh, part of the implementation of the, the project is actually developing and implementing the curriculum for professional development of school leaders in order to help them to to develop uh, inclusive school uh, climate and culture in, in their schools so uh, what we did together with other partners is that actually we developed first the framework of this curriculum and then um, uh, we discussed and uh, have a conversation with uh, some policy makers uh, we have a policy coalition and if i should describe what is the process then the process is i think bottom up and also horizontal because we have a lot of conversations with those policy makers in order to see how they perceive the, the same curriculum. Um, before one, one, one month, we uh, finished the implementation of that uh, curriculum, which was consisted of uh, five modules and 10 days of, of training, which is, I think, a lot. But what, uh, what actually give us this extensive kind of training that actually we uh, how to say we build the community of school leaders with, uh, with the, within the project and right now they have a very strong Viber group and they uh, I'm part of that Viber group and they are um, continue to discuss a lot of uh, topics and even uh, we developed one um, uh, uh, club of uh, book readers now and at Friday we have the first meeting of of uh, club of book readers which is consistent of uh, principles of the schools but what was the topics of the training so it was like uh, uh, more about leadership and a different kind of leadership which are supporting the inclusive climate and culture then we have a model about inclusive climate and also culture uh, we have a module about uh, social inclusion and social justice, which was very important for them. Also about the monitoring and planning some changes in, in their schools. And they have a lot of sharing and the, each module was consisted uh, uh, with one part, which was more how to say cognitive and naming lots of things and lots of concepts, because we think that you should understand the concepts and the research and then you can, of course, implement that. But there was lots of also sharings and uh, not just sharings, but uh, group reflection, because our goal was to uh, build actually the, the learning community, which is consisted of the, of the principles. The feedback is actually great. And uh, now we know, uh, and I, I know that it is the same with uh, uh, another uh, partners. Uh, in this project, especially with the forum, uh, and they say that they have the same same feedback. And now the other principals in Croatia ask us to uh, to organize the training so fast for them because they would like to be included as well. Yeah. So that, that, that's the implementation part. Yeah.
Thank you so much. It is uh, so nice to hear that uh, you have managed to, to find uh, dedicated uh, dedicated uh, uh, participants and uh, create such a strong uh, community. Uh, which leads me to uh, my next question for uh, Patrick. Uh, as in the RIS, you have this uh, whole school approach. Uh, you have involved, as you mentioned, the grassroots organizations as well uh, and community. You are working with teachers, school staff. Uh, can you uh, share with us uh, how are you uh, uh, implementing these activities that are uh, uh, addressing uh, inequalities in education and, uh, and are focused on inclusive school, school culture? Uh, since we are in the beginning of working with schools, uh, I cannot uh, give you uh, specific examples how we uh, this will be done, but uh, uh, we are in the process of implementing of uh, grassroots organization projects. And uh, regarding the report that we have received with uh, from our partners, each of grassroots organization or uh, the, the main focus are having in organizing this information sessions, awareness raising campaigns on uh, specific, uh, specific issues that are uh, integration of low SES students in school life than uh, uh, inequality in education and, and so on. Uh, for example, in Kosovo, uh, last week, our grassroots organization organized a training for teachers with a focus on the discrimination, stereotypes, prejudice, and so on. So uh, this is a way how we can uh, address this issue. And this, for sure, in long term, will have impact on this establishing or creation of, of uh, this environment that uh, uh, Sanya and Vishnya mentioned in, in, in schools. But I think uh, that the main uh, challenge for all of us who are working on this is how we can overcome uh, this uh, uh, discrepancy or, or this uh, uh, gap between the formal doing things formally and doing things concretely in, in, uh, in schools. For example, uh, Vishnya mentioned uh, this uh, establishing of uh, students' councils and stud other bodies or uh, mechanisms within schools that uh, are uh, students are important part of, of that uh, body. But sometimes this are only on papers. If you go and visit schools, they have all list of names who are part of this uh, student's council or parent council. But if you ask them, okay, let me see some of the minutes of the meetings that they had. Uh, immediately you will face a, a, a challenge to find this because it's not that they didn't uh, uh, had meeting uh, or uh, had a meeting minutes of meeting but they didn't have meeting at all so these are some uh, challenges that we have to to uh, overcome somehow and i think a rice uh, uh, approach is that we are trying to uh, build something from the roots. So by uh, having all these things written in SDP, in School Development Plan, and then help schools to develop uh, action plans, and in the same time, support schools to implement that action plans, uh, this means that we will, uh, at least for for the life of the project, uh, we will have something concretely, a concrete results. And our main uh, challenge will be how we can have this uh, impact or this intervention sustain after uh, the project ends. And we think that uh, by having them part of the school 
uh, framework documents like SDP or uh, uh, annual uh, action plan, it is one way, but we have also to make them commit and also to motivate them. But motivation in this, from my point of view, is the results that we will show to them or they will feel at the end of our testing uh, uh, period. I hope that these plans that we have quite well in our minds will be implemented in this way and will have these results and this will help us then to further develop and, and share and disseminate with other schools because as I told you we have only 25 schools in the region but hopefully the results will be shared in other uh, schools as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I know uh, we are uh, short on time, but I would just like to um, come back uh, to the to the initial question and this uh, actually question of the policies. Uh, as we heard, uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, legislation, some policies, both on system level, both on uh, school level, but uh, it it looks like uh, something is missing. And all of uh, all of uh, these projects have strong uh, policy component. So I would like to uh, uh, a bit uh, get your perspective and uh, opinion. Uh, how are you involving uh, the policy makers? Uh, can we make uh, uh, any change uh, that is, uh, as Patrick said, concrete uh, without them? Uh, and uh, how can we actually make them? commit uh, uh, to what they uh, uh, promise. Uh, so I don't know if uh, someone would like to volunteer to go first. I will begin shortly. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, as I said before, maybe uh, one of the <laughs> our ways is let's develop some uh, guidance or policies, how to implement policies. But with these documents, uh, as you, uh, from NEPS, you know, we are uh, now in the process of developing these roadmaps towards the, the uh, policy interventions and what kind of interventions we will do. So in this regard, I think that we have to uh, maybe bring all policies together in one uh, roadmap and then jointly uh, as coalitions that we have part of a rise project to uh push to advo uh, to advocate and to 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 make pressure towards policy making to implement those policies that uh, exist and uh, it's not uh, necessary to do it only in national level this also has to to be start from the uh, schools uh, because also schools are lacking the implementation of, of current uh, uh, legislative framework because uh, they are uh, not willing to do this and no one is asking for uh, the uh, accountability. So this is one aspect that we have to pay attention transparency, accountability. Until we will have these two components, I hope that these policies that are very well written and structured will be implemented. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I uh, would agree with, uh, with you. Uh, Sanya, uh, do you maybe uh, want to share something? Uh, yes, Petr. Thank you for this, and I would I would maybe add one uh, one step more since I'm coming from step by step. <laughs> so and one one step is uh, one between. Uh, it, it seems that uh, at least I think in, in, in our situation that we have uh, policies, you know, we have lots of laws, and they are not so bad in many times. And uh, as you said, there is no implementation. But I think in the middle of these two parts is actually understanding. 
So we write it down, we would like to implement, but very, very often we do not know if we understand the same, if we understand what is the purpose of those, uh, those documents. So what we actually need to do is to open the floor to discuss about what's going on here, what is written here, and what is the purpose of those documents. Because very often those who are working, this is not their guilt, but they are not empowered, you know, to discuss. This is also because we do not have democratic schools and we should empower people to discuss and to say how they are understanding. Very often they see obstacles, but they, they do not see, see opportunities. And maybe we can also work on uh, with them on just, you know, how, how you read those documents, what is written down, and how you would see the implementation, what is your vision of implementation of these documents, because if we just, and you mentioned at the, at the beginning, if we just say inclusion, we know that different people actually see different. When they open the, the door of the room, of the classroom, they expect to see different things and we do not actually build the same vision of the inclusion. Yeah. Maybe just to mention, Eva, what, what we are doing in HEAD, and this is actually the component which is added right now. Um, we realize that it, it would be nice to empower principals to do advocacy for those, how to say, changes they think it should be made in order to build inclusive uh, school uh, cultures. And what we are uh, going to prepare for them is one advocacy training. And uh, during that advocacy training, we would like actually to make them more competent and to build their competencies so they will advocate for some changes on the local level and also on the national level. So actually what we did is that we start from the researches and uh, from the concepts. We build the understanding of those concepts. Then they shared each other what they are doing in the schools. They, they have a community of learning. And now they are prepared actually to advocate for, for some of the changes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanya. This is uh, really a uh, great uh, uh, initiative. Uh, I would just uh, uh, like to hear uh, also from uh, Vishnya and uh, her experiences before we wrap up and uh, go to questions and comments. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for um, these uh, good recommendations. Uh, they are uh, noted from both of uh, previous uh, um, uh, contributions in, in my notebook, definitely. Uh, in terms of the, the, the discrepancy that we have in, in terms of the existing uh, uh, policy framework for, for student voice and actual practice in the schools, uh, definitely I think one of the things that we did and that we plan, uh, that we plan to continue doing is actually that um, uh, as, as organization in our strategic planning, we put uh, student voices horizontal topics. So in all our programs, in all our teaching, the, uh, the teacher trainings and seminars, uh, we will uh, ensure that this topic uh, is, uh, let's, let's say, integrated into the curriculum of the seminar and um, just as, as, as we all, all recognize that the framework exists and the discrepancy or the gap actually comes from uh, uh, different uh, limitations and particularly the attitude of, of, of teachers or let's say adults in the, in the, in the school, uh, school life. So uh, we can only on a school level uh, continue to work on this topic in, in our direct work of schools and hoping that the change will, uh, will, will come. Uh, in terms of the of the the, the national uh, policy level, as, as it was already previously mentioned in our um, also final year, we will also, with the help of the NEPTS, um, uh, create national roadmaps. And uh, um, yeah, this this will be a challenge definitely. In in forum, we are constantly discussing uh, how to we we don't have so much of positive experience in how to include 
and and to get them on board let's say the the, the those who can really uh, make make uh, let's say uh, difference to the practice even from existing and not to mention integrating some new uh, policy developments uh, and and one of the things that I think in forum we will try to do on, on, on the national level let's say to include other stakeholders beside us so so that we have a stronger voice let's say in front of the the, the official policy decision makers which means we will include uh, UNICEF, we will include uh, Obdusman for Children, uh, Youth uh, National Youth Net, uh, Creation Net uh, Network. So, so just other institutions and NGOs who maybe together we will have, uh, let's let's say, because we have the same actually agenda in terms of the the if you, if you look uh, on, on the student voice on children children rights. And in that sense, uh, we, we, we hope, yeah, with the, with the help that, uh, of, of these national roadmaps and exact uh, steps and interventions that uh, we will, uh, yeah, make it. Thank you, Vishnya. Thank you uh, all for uh, sharing uh, your experiences, uh, thoughts, and uh, really some uh, great inspiring uh, actions and uh, initiatives. Uh, for me, it's always nice to hear when the project grows out of uh, its limits and uh, somehow finds its way to, to build actually a community like, uh, like some of you uh, uh, mentioned. And I would like to open the floor now for our audience uh, uh, for questions and uh, comments. I uh, saw in the chat that Ulvia would like to share something. So go ahead. Ulvia. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, downloaded both the reports and I will review them. Thank you very much. And I think I will be using this in the reading materials for my inclusive education course. I think it's very important to have this kind of perspective. Uh, but reflecting to what you said, I have no doubt that it's very important work. And uh, But I just have some comment, maybe strange comment. Um, you know, the overall approach all this to inclusive education culture development, um, it usually was coming from bottom to up. Uh, and it was following this uh, uh, dichotomy of democracy, those who are ruling and those who are ruled by. And so those who are ruling, they should meet the needs of those who are ruled by. Uh, but uh, I don't know about your country context, uh, but when I see in the my country context and country context in the region, uh, you know, I think that policymakers are also vulnerable. They are vulnerable because they are not provided with this uh, many opportunities to learn, to develop, to know, uh, to participate in these change initiatives. We usually, I, I remember from my experience, uh, we usually were inviting them uh, to listen. Uh, and I'm just thinking that maybe for so long time, because for instance, inclusive education reform in Azerbaijan, 20 years, and it's the same. Uh, I think that maybe, uh, maybe sometimes it's reasonable to change the approach and to target those poor policy policymakers who have to meet the needs, but they don't know how and why. That was just strange comment. Thank you so much. But thank you for the materials you developed. Yes, please. Mm, thank you, thank you, Ulia. It's a really interesting comment and uh, food, uh, food for thought. Uh, Lana would like to uh, uh, share something. I can't resist this invitation about poor policymakers. I'm <laughs> sorry, Ulia. <laughs> because we have all these poor people in our systems. We have the poor teachers, the poor school leaders, the poor policymakers. Um, um, and, and in the end, the poorest of, of them all are the students. Um, so I would always focus uh, our, our, our thoughts towards them. But I do agree with Ulvia that policymakers are not empowered. And we constantly come across this where they feel they then don't have power. They are bureaucrats or not bureaucrats. Um, and, and this is a problem. So, so I, I am all for dialogue. Uh, um, and we need to really, really find ways in which we can bring what we are trying to do much closer uh, to what they can do. 
And one of them is, as Sanya said, I think this understanding. I think they also don't really understand how or what um, they're supposed to do. So yeah, <laughs> poor students, number one. Uh, but yes, let's empower everybody. Thank you, Lana. Uh, do we have uh, any more uh, comments or questions for our speakers? <laughs> okay. Uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank you uh, all. Thank you uh, to our panelists for uh, accepting the invitation and sharing all this uh, significant and inspiring work with us. I'm sure uh, uh, we all uh, have a lot to reflect after this, uh, this uh, well, not so short discussion. Uh, but I would also uh, like to thank you uh, all who participated today uh, and I hope we will see you uh, as well uh, next week on our second day of the uh, conference where we will be uh, presenting and discussing about the education policy networks uh, in the first session and in the second session we will uh, address the role uh, of education in the uh, more than uh, urgent uh, uh, needed uh, green uh, transition. So thank you all uh, once again and hopefully we will see uh, you next week. Bye. Thank you.